Good day, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I am very proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2023-2024 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series, where this lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA College of Arts and Sciences, the UVA School of Data Science, and through grants from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. Since 2016, the Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series has focused on the use of data science methodologies, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and statistical modeling as they pertain to differing themes in the biomedical and health sciences. Our theme for this year is focused on the building of partnerships for generative AI training in the biomedical and clinical research areas, where every Friday we enjoy a wide range of leading thinkers um, discussing the issues, promise, opportunities, and hurdles associated with the emerging areas of AI methodologies. Participants selected for our biomedical data science seminar our, excuse me, Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program will leverage these seminar presentations as vital material in our culminating in-person manuscript and grant project development workshop to be held at the Bahia Beachfront Resort located in San Diego, California in June of 2024. We are very excited about this program. We feel it's very engaging and interactive and dynamic, bringing together AI platform developers, biomedical researchers, and university university level educators to better understand the power promise and potential pitfalls associated with the generative AI explosion. Today, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Amy Yaboa Kwarkume from uh, Howard University. Uh, Amy, known uh, collectively as uh, and affectionately as Dr. A, uh, is a scholar, filmmaker, data scientist, and associate professor of Africana Studies in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. Particularly proud of her African heritage, she works as a data scientist centering around AI bias, data inequity, and inequality, and environmental justice. She currently employs Africana Studies, an Africana Studies framework to examine the intersections of race, gender, and technology. And Dr. A is presently the Director of Graduate Studies for the Master's Program in Applied Data Science and Analytics. Uh, advancing Howard University's first major effort in becoming a hub for data science, social justice research, training for the next generation of data scientists. Uh, she is also a PI of the Core Futures Lab, a PI of the NOAA Cooperative Science Center in Atmospheric Sciences and Meteorology, and co-PI for the Race and Tech Lab. In continuing our 2023-2024 Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series theme, Amy's lecture today is entitled Clearing the Air for a Breathable Future, Unraveling the Biomedical Implications of Data Pollution, where she will discuss the rapid progression of AI driven by uh, data, which has transformed global industries, uh, including a significant impact on earth science. She'll discuss recent advances, which have revolutionized weather prediction or system understanding, climate dynamics research, and energy efficiency, all through uh, the use of high-speed climate models, which depend upon uh, a number of different computational and data-driven technologies. Um, her uh, Breathable Futures project at the Core Futures Lab uh, aims to address data deserts in marginalized communities uh, and uh, to uh, conduct other work that impact black, impact black communities, recognizing potential dangers of neglected societal, cultural, and historical considerations. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you're watching via YouTube, thank you so very much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2023-2024 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants and alumni are strongly encouraged to submit any questions they have via the chat feature in their YouTube sessions where I will synthesize these questions and I'll ask them for on your behalf in the last 10 minutes or so of Amy's lecture. And with that, Amy, welcome. We are so excited to have you and we're really, really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, a uh, big thank you to UVA and allowing me to be a part of this forum. It is an honor. Um, as a humanist by training, I am just always excited to kind of work with those who are on the scientist side, the STEM side, in helping us find solutions. So um, once again, thank you for this space. Um, I'm excited not just to present, but also to receive questions um, in helping us build um, a stronger future. Um, so to begin, again, my title of my presentation today is Clearing the Air for a Breathable Future. 
around the biomedical implications of data pollution. I'm focused really on data pollution, and I'll speak more about that and what that means as we go through the presentation. Slide. So just an overview of um, the talk I'll give today. I'll talk a bit about, uh, about my lab, which is the Core Features Lab, which was guides the research. I will help you visualize data pollution and what that looks like. I will talk about some of our community, uh, our core approaches and the communities we work in. And I'll examine two case studies, which is looking at Louisiana and Manchester um, around this issue of data bias, data ethics, and data deserts. And then I'll share um, our current findings and our current uh, prototype with our Breathable Future um, project with an air quality monitor, and then some implications that um, it may give us to understanding some biomedical solutions or solutions in which we can work together um, as a science community in addressing some of these um, issues that have been for many years been a, a, a prolonged issue that hopefully data science um, modeling can improve some of the situations our um, African-American and Hispanic and Native communities are um, dealing with. So to start, to give you some background on um, my lab, the Core Features Lab, right now is myself as the PI, and I have a research team of students who help work from um, high school students all the way up to graduate students. And our work is funded from um, NSF and um, National Science Atmospheric Science, National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, the Bezos Fund, ESRI. We focus a, little, a lot on mapping and us visualizing what communities we're looking at. The North Star of GIS, which is an organization that focuses on um, empowering African Americans to join the spatial mapping community, and then um, NOAA Cooperative um, that at Howard University we lead um, with other institutions and in looking at the atmospheric side of the conversation in this project. So I just want to honor those who have funded our project. So in the Core Futures Lab, um, again to give you some background, um, Core stands for Community Centered Openness Research and Equity, um, guided by the the, the known conversation that data is good. You now, the more data, the better. But when we talk about data um, and what it can do, we must not forget the fact that there are individuals, spaces, communities, ideas, realities that do not have data on them. We have yet to kind of um, acquire data on certain data points, whether it's um, in communities where there are women in communities where there are um, indigenous, in health instances where things aren't digital. Um, there are many data gaps and data deserts that exist. In our lab, we um, look to expand the data grid on these um, areas that are um, uncovered, right? And now in my lab, I have three graduate students, three undergrad students, and four high school students. So at the core, we're trying to bring equity, openness, and kind of center communities through research and data. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes um, that kind of girds the work we're doing, um, particularly around earth science. So when it comes to earth science, it's um, not new that AI and machine learning and many data tools are being used in the earth science realm, whether it's predicting weathers, um, but even though, and I'll read a quote, in sustainability science is where big data and machine learning are quickly becoming standard tools, little is known about how bias and inequality will propagate through to the output. We are pulling in data from satellites, bios, draft, um, weather stations, and a wide range of autonomous sensors, phishing logs, and even social media sites to plug into algorithms. So we have all the technology. In some cases, we have all this data, right? But at the same time, we still have communities that lack clean water, clean air, um, and livable living conditions. So as a field, um, as an institution of research, um, what does it mean for us to be able to imagine new realities for certain communities, but for other communities, that's not the case, right? There are ways in which science can um, use, has been used to create clean water um, out of the atmosphere, right? But there are people who still lack clean water in their pipes, right? So um, this work looks at some of the bias that exists when we're talking about big data, machine learning, AI, even generative AI, what does it mean to not have um, in our models communities that need these solutions the most when it comes to earth sciences? So what is data pollution? Help us, what is data pollution? So um, 
Ben Shar talks about as, as a framework, understanding the harms of the data economy and the regulatory responses to address these issues. So um, it's one thing to say that data is everywhere, right? But at the same time, it isn't. And um, for those of you who work in the machine learning AI world, we know that um, the quality of your data matters, right? Good data in, your model works fine, hopefully you get good outcomes. But when we have bad data going in, right? And many times we have bad outcomes coming out, right? Data pollution is the um, it in interrelated adverse impact that the generation storing, handling, and processing of digital data has on our natural environment, social environment, and the personal environment. It is an unsustainable handling, distribution, and generation of data resources. So when we look at data in itself, um, data lakes, um, in the case of data warehouses, um, many ways in which we're collecting data, there are environmental impacts that come with that. Right? Where is it stored? How do we house it? The, the energy use, right? the cloud space, right? there is a strain on the environment that comes with even having so much data right? on one side alongside not having quality data. Right. Uh, so data pollution has a dynamic conversation where we have, is it useful to us to be able for us to um, understand our world? Um, if it doesn't give us a full picture of what that world looks like, and then what does it mean to have so much data, right? Even from the environmental science side, when that data itself is pulling down from the environment, right? Um, urban heat islands, um, destroying physical communities to be able to build towers or warehouses, right? What, what, what happens when we have that type of pollution disruption? So my, my, my project first started with um, two incidences that I read about. Um, and again, I'm helping you, I'm a humanist at heart, so I like to tell stories. Um, Jack Sillen had put on Twitter um, in 2021 he had taken some time to, at the time there was a hurricane in Texas, to look at where next rad um, satellites were positioned. So if you're familiar with the Weather Service environmental um, uh, research, there are satellites that NOAA um, and uh, those who are in weather prediction have as physical structures in place to be able to collect data on what's happening when it pertains to weather. So Jack decided to kind of plot these satellites on a map, but also overlay percent population um, African-American communities in Texas. And what he found was, in many cases, the radius of coverage and data collection for these satellites um, didn't cover areas where we see a large population of African-Americans, right? So we see right there, just in the structural layout of the data collection process, there's a bias there bias and race, where from the communication standpoint, when it talks about knowing what's happening in your community, um, how severe that is, or how much time you have to make a decision to leave when it comes to weather, um, if you happen to be in a community that is um, largely a Black community, you may find gaps there. And there has been research that talks about these gaps between these structures in data reporting when it comes to weather, right? And there's some communities that have been reported to say that in many cases, you rarely get their reported weather. You're getting their reports from another community that doesn't reflect their own, right? And some of that is a structural question with um, federal agencies and how these satellites or and satellites and structures were placed, right? So we see that there. Um, another um, example that came to me um, and why I kind of jumped into the conversation was uh, there's an article that came out in 2019, 2019 that talked about Louisiana. Um, the state had approved, based upon EPA data, for a plastic company to be moved into Cancer Alley. Um, and Cancer Alley, if you're not familiar with Cancer Alley, this is a area of Louisiana where, um, as the title says, unfortunately, residents um, have higher cancer risk. Um, and it's not by coincidence, but it's based upon their actual surroundings, which are um, chemical plant and facilities that emit um, toxins into the air. So the question was, how does the state approve based upon the EPA's data um, to move this move, move additional company in this area that's already um, facing um, healthcare issues, air quality issues, population decline, um, 
in many cases for profit, right? So this will be the biggest factory um, and the state will kind of be able to get that reward, right? So these two questions came up and um, I began to think about if um, earth science, if NOAA, if EPA, if researchers are trained to be using the generative models, right, AI, to be able to kind of find solutions, what happens if you're not in the data, right? What happens when the data representing, that's supposed to be representing your location or your community is in quality, right? So on one level, there's no data, right, causing bias. To another level, the data isn't as accurate to my specific situation. So in Louisiana, we see the EPA approving that. Um, and then same year, right, the, the social outcry is like, how could that happen? How could this, how could another company move in when we already know things are that bad? But then the response is, well, the EPA says it's not that bad, right? So the question is, where does the EPA, a government agency that's supposed to be the um, outward facing neutral party that's supposed to protect people's quality of living? How do, where are they getting their data from? How is that um, accurate, right? Um, so again, much more, more articles, just talking about what communities are dealing with, where they're saying they know that the air quality isn't good. Um, they smell it, right? They're going to the hospitals, feeling it. Um, but the EPA um, and federal agencies aren't saying that. So again, to continue to visualize, gonna love telling stories and telling stories with pictures. All right, so one of the main communities, which I'll kind of come back to towards the end of the talk, is Mossville, Louisiana. Um, Mossville, Louisiana, we talk about Cancer Alley, um, is along Lake Charles, and using GIS mapping, um, we can see in this picture within a four mile radius, which is somewhat Mossville, we see um, chemical, petro petrochemical companies um, and plastic companies around the community. So this is Mossville, Louisiana, and here we see the companies that are along this area. Um, you go to the EPA website, the air toxin screen mapping, you can also visually see they've plotted all the companies, right, that emit toxins with these green dots, right? So it's not, there's not as if the EPA doesn't know, right, that these companies exist, these companies are um, emitting toxins, they do know, right? So we have the community, which you can look at physically, then the EPA knows that there um, are these there's factories that also exist. To give you a more better picture, all right, the EPA also reports on toxin emissions. About every five, between every five to 10 years, the EPA does um, a test of toxins in the air. Um, and within this um, EPA track, or we say census track, these are the list of chemicals that the EPA um, has either in the past noted an emission of this toxin. And in this time, this is 2019, the level of toxicity in that specific area with these toxins, right? So um, it isn't often, but the EPA does take um, account of what toxins happen to be in this air. And this, this is some of the data that is used to create language around Cancer Alley or the Petro Metro, right? So there is data, but not as frequent um, as traditional air quality, which we see now at every two to three minutes, All right? So then again, another EPA website, more data. If you go to the EPA website, the EPA will tell you out of the facilities that exist within this parish, right? What specific company is emitting that specific um, toxin and how much, right? So more data. More data we see here. Um, I want to zero in on this is again going back to Mossville. In the Mossville area, we have these seven companies that are around them that emit toxins, and Sossil is one of the closest ones. And if you look at the Sossil um, company and the data that they're providing, um, okay. So Sossil is the this Sossil is the um, the company right here most some of the closest to Mossville. Um, if you look at this image, um, and I know people can't respond to me, but this is a GIS map of a street image um, picture. And we see this is Lake Charles, which is a blue, generally speaking, it should be a blue um, river of water. Um, if you look at a image of a remote satellite, 
actual image overhead of the area, we said we said it's not blue, it's brown, right? So um, not only are people talking about what they're smelling, talking about what they know isn't, um, they feel isn't clean, talking about their, their rates of cancer, right? Um, you can also see physically in the water quality, that's another pro part of our project too, that the water quality also isn't good, all right? But if we look at, um, sorry, so this is images of their water quality, all right? Um, just so you, so we can see, um, but, According to the city of St. Um, Lake Charles, they'll say that we are pleased to report our drinking water meets all federal and state regulatory requirements, right? So according to their data collection um, reports, they're saying that you can drink the water. It is safe, right? So we see some of the disconnect with the data that's being collected on the federal side when it comes to even drinking water, the same as is, we see that exists within air quality with certain communities, right? Um, so the question becomes, what's causing this bias? What's causing this gap? Um, wh what is happening where um, at one side, we see a um, a sense of the EPA and government agency saying, well, what we see is good um, from the air and water, but people aren't seeing that, right? And in many cases, what we see is a disproportionate um, level of burden on many Black, Hispanic, and Native American communities where there's there are large biases um, within these data sources of what people are experiencing. All right. Um, so another visualization of the map, if you look at Esri from 2013, the same Mossville community, on the right hand side, we see a um, geo uh, spatial map overlay um, using uh, Google Earth of the same area 10 years ago. Um, and this is 10 years later with the amount of construction in the area. All right. Um, so we see a decrease in vegetation which we talk about tree coverage and air quality, um, we know just such large amounts of deforestation changes your air quality. Okay, this is the map I was going for. So these are all the toxins that this one company emits, which is Sasso, which the EPA reported um, for three years in a row. And in many cases, if you look at some of the um, toxins over time, these their level of admission has gone up, all right? Um, so, um, when looking at um, benzene, we see benzene goes from six to eleven, it almost doubles in three years, right? And the EPA does know this. The EPA has collected data on this, um, and they have it. But the question is, how they continue to report that the air quality is good, right? So, if you go to the uh, EPA website, Air Now, and they will say that they they are just the ones that house the data that comes from Lake Charles reporting area, right? Um, and you can do this yourself, go to air quality now, you can put in your location and it should give you a sense of air quality reading. And on many cases, um, I have yet to see a day in Louisiana, the specific location we just looked at, that the air quality isn't good or just slightly above um, good into the area of yellow, All right? So the EPA reports good on a daily basis um, based upon their monitors they do have in the area. They all show green as good. Um, Sometimes we see in Baton Rouge, maybe in moderate, um, but going back to our map, we see here just green. Everything is okay. Um, and we know this is um, data that many people use for modeling. This is um, what many people use to understand air quality issues. This is what many people use to be able to um, allocate resources for decision making and who needs to have um, maybe equipment or air quality initiatives, right? So um, in many cases, these agencies are saying that everything is good. Right, the ozone is good. PM two point five is good. Um, people's air quality is good. So we can continue to move forward to make these decisions that we feel are better, improving the lives of these residents. Um, when that's not the case, what these residents are feeling. Um, so, what has been our approach? Our question has been: How do we deal with these biases, these gaps in data? Right, these data deserts where people's lived experiences aren't re reflecting the data that people are collecting. And in many cases, this PM2 data from the EPA um, or from the Lake Charles um, government agency, they're reported by every two minutes, right? So what's happening there where people have large amounts of data about communities? And if I've never maybe traveled to Louisiana, never traveled to Mossville, I would think that their air quality is good, right? Um, so what we've done is we, we're looking at uh, five, uh, more than five communities. We've added two most recently um, and looking at what's happening there between not just the air, but also the water. Um, so we're looking at 
um, and also heat issues. Uh, Miami, Florida, um, the Bronx, New York with river, um, DC and Baltimore with air, the Petro Metro. Um, we're looking at Manchester, Houston, Texas, Cancer Alley, which is Mossville. We've also added um, a community in uh, Maui, um, particularly raised the Maui fires, the East Boston uh, air toxin. So East Boston, particularly close to the um, Logan Airport, where they have airports flying back and forth, um, vehicles idling for long hours. How do they talk about air quality issues when, um, generally speaking, if you look at their air index as well, the EPA says, says the air is good. All right. So that's the communities we're working with. And our approach in trying to understand what's happening is to ask different questions. We've spent time just not um, looking at the data, right, and asking questions of the data, but also getting to know the communities we're looking at. So our approach has been getting to know who lives there, um, who are they, um, where they come from, how they get to this community. And interesting, some of our interviews, we've noticed that um, many individuals have moved into communities where um, these were areas that were originally zoned just for industrial use. But because of cost of living and not being able to afford to live in residential areas, the people are moving into industrial areas. Or at one point, um, that place was residential, but over time it's changed over to now be industrial, right? So it's kind of a sense of um, urban planning, right? Is also an issue in conversation with some of these air quality communities, right? We ask our community members, how do they, how do they experience um, the issues they're facing? Do they understand what's going on as far as air quality? Do they understand what it means to um, read a, two, a PM 2.5 reading? Do they understand what is toxic and what isn't toxic? Um, where they come from, what's, what are some of their cultural groundings in understanding um, earth science, atmospheric research, right? And how do they make decisions? Because in many cases, what we're seeing is um, people don't have access to data, right? Not having access to data, quality data doesn't help someone make the best decision. So when it comes to healthcare outcomes and understanding impacts of what it means to maybe play outside or um, be exposed to such diesel, to diesel fuel, um, understanding how people live their daily lives will help us help them make solutions um, because we cannot move an airport. In many cases, we cannot relocate people who are living in areas that are industrial. So, but maybe we can help in helping them figure out what decisions they can make better if they were given um, quality data, right? And then some of the layers of institutional racism that exist that we can probably help support through policy um, and change and just having more information. Um, so at the core, we are focused on communities of African descent, Hispanic descent, and, and, and also indigenous communities in helping them understand what it means to um, have access to data, one, but also give them the power to be able to make decisions better with the data they have, all right? The EPA part, the government agency part, that is the part that we're also thinking about as well. Um, but the community part is what we're centered on. What does it mean for someone to know their specific air quality? And how can that help them improve their lives? So in our lab, um, we have um, a group of students that have different areas of study. We have sociology, sociology political science, African-American studies, sports medicine, um, environment studies, and atmospheric science. Again, our students come from high school, undergrad, um, and senior researchers from our partners at the National Center of Atmospheric Research. Um, we truly believe that some of the solutions that we may find um, may not come in my lifetime. So having younger students as young as high school engage in these conversations creates a pipeline, right? Creates not only a career pipeline, but also a, a longer um, lens and solutions. So in our lab, um, we're community-centered, but very intergenerational. We know that sometimes some of our young people have even better ideas than we do. Um, so that's something that we intentionally have. And then I skip um, the first point. Um, in our lab, in the communities we're working on, working in and partnering in, um, the students come from those communities. So students come from Miami, Florida, a student comes from Houston, Texas, a student is from the Bronx, students from Baltimore. Um, and that creates a sense of um, unity and also helps speed up the community partnership because they're from the community and understand the community, they're able to um, help us connect with people in helping them understand some very heavy issues that we may not have the solution for, right? But we're helping them help us and uh, help them in a way that having somewhat of an insider um, 
connection helps. All right, so that's the approach we're taking the communities we are serving. Um, so the two case studies um, I want to show as far as some of the findings we have um, is Mossville, Louisiana, which I talked about a little bit earlier. So Mossville historically, and getting their cultural story, um, this is a community that goes far back as enslavement. So um, enslaved Africans, um, seven families started this community in Mossville. Um, and over time, they grew to be a very self-sustaining community. Um, and over time, with the movement of these petrochemical companies into the area, there has been drastic decline. Um, and the community um, right now is struggling just to sustain um, itself as a unit um, to the to the point that the exist the biggest company that exists in that area, which is Sossel, used to be Mossville High School. All right, so all the families that live in that area right now um, go to work and go to school outside of that original community boundary, right? Because there's so many companies that have taken over their land that they have there. Um, so in Mossville, did I say yes? So in Mossville, the question becomes: um, How does the EPA say the air quality is good? How do they have monitors that show um, the air quality is good, um, but people are not? Um, feeling that life experience. So one thing that um, if you're familiar with uh, EPA's air quality index, it does not include toxins. So when we talk about data bias um, and data discrepancies, uh, when you're looking at a air quality index from the EPA, um, toxins are not included in that um, number. Um, and that's somewhat what these communities are dealing with. The fact that toxins in the air and its ability to not be included in data points um, has caused issues and has caused tension with them being able to protect themselves when um, decisions are being made based upon EPA air quality data. All right, so there's a major gap there when we're talking about decision making based upon what data points you're looking at. The infrequency of the data collection when it comes to air toxins also points a challenge where if um, the EPA's NATA data only being collected every five to 10 years doesn't show a large amount of frequency and people understanding um, the cumulative effects of such exposure, right? So unless you have the equipment or the personal expenses to um, collect that data over time yourself, communities just don't know how bad it is. Um, they're able to give, they're given some um, moments of uh, shots of information um, but over time, that cumulative, cumulative conversation isn't um, collected, right? And what they are told on a daily basis is that the air quality is good, the air quality is good, the air quality is good. Yes. So um, presently, um, the EPA does have a monitor um, in Mossville, and that monitor is right next to one of the major companies um, that permits, that um, sends out toxins in the air. So you would think that, okay, the best solution would be let's monitor these um, companies, um, these institutions that are emitting these toxins. And they do have a monitor um, that shows a green um, good, thumbs up from the EPA. Um, but again, these monitors do not test for toxins, right? So communities are faced with what do we do when we know that there's issues in our air. Um, the EPA now is monitoring, but they're not monitoring what we believe or we know should be what's monitored. How do we close that gap in the data, right? Where um, in many cases, this community has a monitor from the EPA, but there are many communities that don't. So another community that we're looking at is in Manchester. Um, somewhat the same issue, um, using GIS mapping. We see industrial facilities all around. We see a train yard that also emits pollution. We see sewage and waste facilities. Um, and this community in Manchester um, is residential, right? Surrounded by industrial facilities all around. Um, and if you go to the EPA website um, to say what how their air quality is being monitored, you'll see not so much a monitor in the community, the one the community doesn't, this has been turned off, right? So that's also another issue as far as gaps in data. Um, some structural infrastructure um, has not been sustained in many cases. So around this Manchester community, we see four monitors that are not in use. And the one that is in use, that gives you a green air quality good. But that um, monitor is outside and across the river from the Manchester community. 
Right. And this is another community that also has the same issues of cancer, health outcomes that the Mossel community has. All right. So what we have begun to do at Howard is um, help support communities figure out how to best um, understand their air quality issues. Now, this is not something that's new. The um, citizen science, the open science field of just allowing people to have personal monitors um, is kind of, but it's, 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 but it's budding. Um, the most popular is the purple air monitor that you can kind of put up, plug in, and be open source and be able to monitor your air quality. Um, with this project, we are looking to create something that is definitely, um, it's IoT, 3D printed, uh, low cost, um, and solar powered, right? So you don't have to plug it in for power. But we want to be able to provide communities at least some level of um, hyper local understanding of their air quality for them to be able to make their own decisions. Also compare their numbers to what the EPA or other federal agencies may be providing. Um, but with that, that involves us, one, first talking about creating a data plan, right? So we're talking about empowering communities to understand data, um, but many communities lack that understanding. So we, we want to talk about data, what that means to know what your air quality is, how to read your air quality, and how to help support a private um, network in ways in which you feel that your data is not at risk, right? Um, that's one. Two, we're helping the communities build and print their 3D um, air quality monitor. Um, we'll deploy that monitor and that the monitor will be um, IoT, so they'll be able to kind of look at the data on their mobile device or computer. Um, we'll, we'll try, we'll, we're looking to help support the community understanding if there is a bias between their reading and the EPA or that federal government agency's reading, um, and then build community capacity. Um, in the long run, um, again, we are, the, the, the idea of mo moving an airport or moving a family is not probably the best solution, um, but we can probably create ways to empower the community to kind of protect themselves around issues, um, whether it's filtration, whether it's policy, whether it's just knowing when to go out and not to go out because of um, poor air quality conditions. Um, those are the five principles we're kind of putting into this project called the Breathable Futures Project. Um, again, these are some of my schools too, which are holding the first prototype that we have started with. The second prototype that we've created right now is something that's more, um, we feel community centered. So it's a birdhouse. Um, in that birdhouse, you see um, the air quality monitor, the battery, the solar panels on the roof, um, and the Wi-Fi uh, microchip that sends the data to the end user um, that we're deploying. Our first deployment was at Howard University. At Howard University in DC right now, there's so much construction um, on campus that we were concerned about the early learning center on campus. So we have an early learning center with kids between three and six, and they go outside to play every day. So we deployed this monitor to be able to understand what their air quality levels were and their exposures were um, as they're young and developing children. We understand that um, when it comes to diesel fuel, idling, um, pollution, these have stronger impacts on young children than they, ha than they have on adults. Um, so this has been our first prototype that um, we deployed and students have been very excited um, and the data we're getting in, we're looking to in the phase two of this to look at that data and see if we do have differences in um, air quality exposure um, during work hours, during morning hours, and especially during the time when the kids are outside playing. Um, can we find ways to help the school make better decisions on um, how to create um, a less amount of exposure to them if we know that there are large amounts of air pollutants in the air. So this is version two of the first model the students are holding. The goal is for every community to help us, help them print their own monitor. So their monitor should look like their community. They should feel like they're empowered to say that uh, we put this up there for us to understand what our data is. Um, and that can possibly help not them, not only make better, better decisions, but if you're a researcher, looking to make decisions for their community or looking for data to run models for what, what does it mean to have clean air for this community. They now have a repository of data points that is hyper-local to their community and what they're breathing um, that can be added on to what other agencies may have. So when it comes to the biomedical part, 
um, in case, again, I'm a historian, um, also now moving to data science. Um, but well, in talking to some of, um, and this is kind of focused on the health part, and what are the, some of the health risks or some health gaps we see that come from data pollution, not having these data deserts or having this data that isn't quality. Um, flawed scientific conclusions, right? Um, in speaking to health professionals, doctors, researchers who work in the area, um, they've noticed that when it comes to illnesses, when it comes to treatment, when it comes to diagnoses, when um, even they aren't educated on some of the environmental justice issues or conversation or language, they are reporting things incorrectly. Um, so for example, in many cases where people are having a large amount of exposure to a toxin, right? Um, without having that knowledge or background as a professional, um, you may categorize maybe their sickness or disease or something else. So there is a gap in understanding some of the environmental sciences of um, toxicity, exposure, cumul cumulative health risks that our medical schools have not conjoined on to be able to capture quality data, right? Um, in our community in Miami, they were looking at, um, we're looking at urban heat islands and um, the impacts of elevated temperatures. Um, so the weather station may report a temperature at, let's say, 75 or 80, um, but people are really feeling 85, 90. So when people are coming into the emergency room or coming into the ER, passing out, um, and a doctor isn't um, trained on some of the health language around the environmental aspects of over heat exposure, right? Um, when you happen to be a senior citizen on medication that is sensitive to heat, um, not putting that in a full description of the chart or the treatment um, creates poor data for us to be able to address some of these health or environmental concerns, right? Understanding health outcomes and cause of death, um, again, not having that language creates a challenge in us also finding solutions to these data problems and also modeling and doing research, right? If we're not able to robustly understand the connection between poor air quality, lack of quality data, um, lack of um, precise data that is localized to communities, um, we'll be modeling for um, the not the wrong future, but, but not a future that matches the future that people are really living. So if people are facing higher and elevated levels of exposure and we're modeling based upon lower numbers, we're under modeling or under reporting what people are lived experiences are. Impaired decision making. So when it comes to health behavior um, situations and interviewing people, um, particularly those who have asthma in air quality, if I'm using, uh, many cases we may use our cellular phone or watch the weather to understand what is happening. Um, so we look at my phone, I say, oh, it's raining, I'll take an umbrella. Right, I look at my phone and say, oh, it's this temperature. I wear a jacket, don't wear a jacket. If you happen to have asthma and using the air quality index, right, to be able to maybe go for a run um, and the air quality index is underreported and you have asthma, we see right there um, a behavioral challenge, right? That the fact that you may go for a run, they may have an asthma attack, all right? So not having quality data that is being pushing through these models or pushing through these um, AI um, decision um, tools, um, we run the risk of people making, thinking they're making the best health decision, but in many cases they aren't, right? If you have young children who are going out to play outside, um, and we know that going out to play is a healthy behavior, but if you're exposed to toxins when you go outside, how do we um, support that? That that isn't a healthy decision if we know that at this time of day, we have airplanes who are permitting um, this much amount of toxins in the air, right? How do we create um, better behavior? And then also transportation, um, air quality, uh, particularly with forest fires, not knowing um, what is happening in these realms specific to your location does cause a challenge. The last thing is um, the EPA and the federal agencies are dealing with the PM 2.5 conversation, which is, a, which is a certain level of air quality measurement. But there's a whole bunch of literature beyond um, the PM 2.5 at the nanoparticle level, right? So there are particles that exist below 2.5 that there isn't robust amounts of data, right? So at the 2.5 level and around there, um, some communities are able to have information, but many communities are, are dealing with nanoparticles, right? It's about diesel fuel, right? These are um, particles that are smaller than 2.5 that we're not capturing data on that has cumulative effects on people's health that 
Um, on one level, having just 2.5 at a local level is helpful, um, but drilling down even lower to see, particularly when it comes to children, what they're exposed to, um, indoor and outdoor, um, would help us be able to close the gap in these environmental issues that communities that lack data on or lack data knowledge um, need to be able to live healthier lives. Um, so from the biological sense, I'm just so excited to hear your questions um, and input because um, we spent a lot of time thinking through who are the communities that aren't um, within this data grid that need to be put on a data grid. Um, and then what are the gaps that exist within that data that needs to be elevated from a quality standpoint for us to then move into modeling a, um, a better future for them, a cleaner future for them, right? But at this point, um, we lack many data gaps that aren't allowing communities that need the most um, level of um, modeling to be able to see that they can kind of possibly have a future, have a brighter or cleaner um, drinkable um, future compared to other areas that have robust amounts of data on them. Um, I think I have one more slide. Yeah, so the future um, is going to continue to look at more of these communities that are, have data gaps. Um, there are many communities that um, lack localized information about their weather, right, specific to their location. They're getting information from a nearby airport about temperature when their temperature is um, sometimes 10 to 15 degrees higher, in many cases also lower. Um, and then kind of our goal is to um, have monitors sent out to communities and whatever community boundary they decide, um, they will have access to their data. So if your researcher wants to look at what's happening in Mossville, you'd have to consent with the Mossville community to understand, um, to get permission to look at their data, right? Um, and the goal is with AI and generative AI is to possibly triangulate a community's data. So if we're able to get a community that has maybe four or five homes with a monitor, can we, using their data, allow them to be alerted to what they feel their level of good is? So they define their own level of good, they define their own level of what they feel isn't good and above, um, but also if there's a route that is predictively better in walking for a child, or if there's a monitor at a park that can and tell a family that this is a good time to play, um, Gen AI will be able to help kind of um, process all that air quality data to be able to give meaningful impact and answers to decisions they'll make, whether it's playing, walking, running, um, or even when to even change your filters because your filter may have accumulated this much amount of toxin exposure. Um, so those, those are some of the future goals that we have with the project as we begin to build more monitors. Um, and I think that is the last slide I have. I wanna say thank you. And I'm very excited to hear your questions and comments um, and continue to work um, with the sciences, social sciences, and even the history of these communities to be able to find better futures. Thank you. Amy, thank you so very much. That was, I mean, this is an important, topic to, I think for us you know as we're we've just entered Black History Month and I think that it's very important that we kind of recognize that you know a lot of the communities of color whether they're black or Hispanic or indigenous cultures seem to be those that have uh, unfortunately are they are the ones that seem to suffer the most from air pollution water pollution and contaminated soils and that as you kind of point out that these things are you know they're historically rooted and that it's time that we kind of recognize these things and that you know i'm just kind of curious about some of your thoughts on these things about the level of you know it, it, sort of intentionality to it or was it just accidental do you think that there's something systematic or structural about some of these biases in the data collection which are, you know, when you look at them, you think, oh my gosh, the, the you know, they're in Louisiana, there's this whole swath of, of folks who are, they're not being monitored um, by, by the satellites, for example. And I'm just kind of curious, do you think that there's, you know, was that by design or was it just kind of, it just happened that way? And it, we're just, we're observing the negative effect of that in the, in the afterthought, or I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, research shows that some of this was by design. It's about urban planning, mm -hmm. right? So historically, urban planning had a, a racial 
grounding that um, historically there were communities that were valued and communities that weren't valued. And when it came to the communities that they felt that were valued, they needed the monitoring, all right? Mm. So these are areas where we feel that there's other high, also high population density, right? Um, they're the ones that we're trying to monitor. And we're using this um, sense of value judgment to be able to kind of predict what's happening next. But areas that we don't feel deemed valuable, there's no need to possibly monitor those areas. So we do see a structural historical overlay of some infrastructure, right? that is used to collect data that now, if we as researchers today want to be equitable, we have to think about where am I getting this data? Does it um, provide a, a full range of coverage on the area I'm thinking of, right? So if, again, if I go to the EPA website, I can put in Mossville, it'll tell me something. Um, but does that mean that what it's telling me is really what I am thinking as a researcher, right? So. Um, Structurally, just things have historically been places for reasons that we're trying to kind of undo, um, but we're just not there yet. And it takes responsible researchers to just ask questions of the data. As much as we're modeling um, a future, um, if we continue, if we don't ask questions of data, we will begin to model a future that leaves people out. What do you think of the? I mean, the the placement of the sensors is probably vital in all of this. So, as you kind of pointed out. There's a community that was deemed, uh, you know, to be one where the sensor should go, right? And then there's another community on another, you know, some distance away. That's where a sensor should go. But it's the community in the middle, which perhaps is predominantly, you know, people of color, for example, that that's you're interpolating between the two sensors where the air quality is already good, but it could be that that air quality in the middle is bad. I mean, are you, are, is there a, a challenge of the interpolation or the imputation of that data? Even if the data is of high quality, it's just being interpolated wrong and being misapplied. Is that a sense that we're, we've stumbled into that too? Yes, we have, um, you know, placement matters. And, and as a researcher, um, the intentions of what you're trying to generalize or solve um, we just need to be mindful of the fact that, yes, these um, systems, AI, it would take what you give it. So um, if we're talking about a missing value, how we deal with missing values are important. Some may just throw it out. It's not there. Some may make two, take two averages and give it uh, um, the average of those two just to get to that um, midpoint, right? And that does create challenges because culturally people are living different and diverse lived experiences. Um, and having um, census data down to the track in many cases may not be enough, right? So really knowing um, the area that you're looking at um, and the dynamics down to, in many cases, the block level is very much needed. Um, and th there's, a, there's a challenge between having, in many cases, monitoring also sounds like surveillance, right? So the, the, the yeah. more monitoring we have, the better, right? Like the more data points we have, the better. But then we also think about how much do we over serve do, do 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 are we putting tech at the level of oversaturation right um and also want to add that part of the cultural conversation we had with the communities is that sometimes um we fail to um we don't take the time to just speak to the communities themselves and ask them what do you think are some of the ways we can find solutions for air quality issues um instead of just putting monitors everywhere all right sometimes monitors just like the mosque there's a monitor right next to the um, the, the the industrial facility and it says it's good so it's not the monitor it's just how are we giving meaningful understanding to what it's what does air quality mean so it's a formula so we should probably be changing how we define air quality what are the parameters of that um model we're using maybe we should include more toxins in that formula so that can give us a more accurate sense of what people are, are living um so yeah it's 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 very hard but dealing with missing data um, is very important when it comes to particularly marginalized communities. What's the role of trust in this? You mentioned, you know, kind of surveillance, you know, it's, it gets a little bit dangerous. Yes, we're monitoring things, but people are worried about being surveilled. And it seems that there's, you know, cameras everywhere these days. What's the role of trust with kind of engaging the communities and making sure that they're okay with this and that they don't see ill intent when the best intentions are 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 being sought. Yeah, I know it's it's hard because for communities that are facing these challenges, um, and I say communities because I'm I'm living in one of those communities. I've come I've I grew up in the Bronx 
And if someone told me to put a monitor in my house, the question I'd be like, okay, what are you monitoring for? Is it is there something else involved in this monitoring? Even yeah. though my quiet living, right? So trust um, science and research for many of our communities is a nasty word. Um, the trust has been broken um, for many years. Uh, from um, Just knowing that uh, researchers have come in, taken information, gotten awards, publications, and left people um, with no outcomes or no solutions or um, no information or no no credit, no acknowledgement as well. Um, so trust is very much a part of the data science journey in being able to find solutions. And I think for our project, what we start with is what are the questions that you have about air quality? Right? What do you want to know? And one of the questions that the family gave us was, I want to know whether my child should go outside to play today. All right. So we can we can create data that can help you make the decision. But if we're, we're not if we're not clear about the questions that people have um, that are more important than maybe the questions that we have or what we seem to think are more important, um, the trust won't be there, right? But I think we need to trust that people um, have questions themselves that we can help support them using data um, and also educate and empower communities um, in creating larger research communities outside of our institutions. But trust is, is so important um, because it has been broken. Um, and as we begin to rebuild those that trust and create uh, more citizen scientists, we have to rebuild that trust. Is there any benefit to communicating the results from, for example, I love your birdhouses. I think those are so great. <laughs> That's uh, kudos to you for developing that in, in a, the form factor you've chosen. Those are great. Is it helpful at all to say, take the data from those and communicate those to the community through like local news uh, outlets, for example, you know, your your local weather report, for example, could take that information and supplementing it with regard to, you know, the the National Weather Service or whatnot, um, you know, you communicate that to the, you know, to the local community so they become familiar with it. Yeah, so I think the goal with using AI and generative AI is um, when we have these large repositories of localized data, they can pull from their own repositories, right? And the data can also kind of be added on to for historical data. So is today a good day to go out? Is 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 it is it a good time to go out? Um, compared to last week, what should I kind of do? And it does become very hyper local, and it can be added to what they're what they may be um, seeing on TV and in and in um, the newspapers, right? But it gives empowers the communities kind of have their own control, right? Have their own sense of, if we want to create a community of diverse me meteorologists, young people can kind of have this tool to say, I understand what this says. I understand the temperature, I understand the PM2 reading, I understand this. And they can be excited about kind of, again, building career pathways um, if they can have it and it be translated in their own language, right? So for many Hispanic communities, it's a language translation challenge. Um, for many um, other communities who may not be educated, it's a literacy challenge. Um, but yes, it can be coupled with what's already existing out there. But I think for us, we're trying to say we're help, helping communities control control themselves. Like you can be your own weather person and you can take your iPhone reading and this monitor reading and compare it and see, is there a difference? What's causing that difference? Then you decide for yourself what you decide, what, whether you want to go out or how long or what type of outfit you want to wear to go out, I guess I should say. Thinking a little differently than being hyper local necessarily i'm also aware that there are communities who are sometimes referred to as the downwinders right where there's a, a somebody who's a, or someone a, some company that is polluting and they pollute into their atmosphere but the wind takes it and blows the particulates or whatever it is miles and miles away um and uh, to be honest with you i grew up in a community that was sort of affected by that and i'm curious if some of these sensors you know deployed up in strategically could help with those kind of communities as well yeah so this kind of goes to kind of the question of like wildfires right so we uh, i guess many of us in the northeast were kind of alerted to this sense of wildfire like spread like it's coming our way could it be um used in that way i think yes but that's a like a larger commercial level sense of um, sharing data across outside that specific community to warn someone else. So um, there is a whole conversation around the communication of air quality and how do we create a network that lets other people know, all people be aware of maybe hyper local conversations that are maybe coming down your way. Um, and I think that's, that's what AI can do, definitely. If we're able to triangulate all these 
hyperlocal citizen science monitors into maybe a massive um, interconnected network that lets everyone know what's happening, where we can definitely deal with wildfires, we definitely deal with um, communities where um, institutions are, the, the emissions are just not local, but it's widespread and people know, and people know how to make decisions better. But I think that's where the power of having more data um, and building out um, systems that are networks that speak to each other from the environmental sciences to the health sciences, to the public health, to the healthcare system. Um, so people can prepare. Um, and from an economic standpoint, we don't face the burden of dealing with um, so many health concerns that um, could be a behavioral change if people knew more. Professor Amy Korkame from uh, Howard University, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us uh, as we enter Black History Month. These are important conversations to have, continue having, and to return to um, as we're thinking about how best to use data and make it equitable for everyone and to really help everyone understand how to you know, take advantage of these data to make life decisions um, about themselves, their personal health and well-being of their communities. So thank you, Amy. I really, really appreciate you sharing your, your research with us. It's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. You have a wonderful weekend and everyone who's joined us have a wonderful weekend as well.